I will be forever the myth. Yeah, yeah. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken. <laughs> Did you ever hear, you remember Gear Borgen Paulson, the guy sure. who was in third place? Yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, uh, Joe Weed. Huh? You know, he's he in Norway. Physique. Yeah, Norway. Uh, Joe, yeah. We Joe Weeder, uh, in 1990, you remember when they started the WBF? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, man, uh, Joe, you know, you remember, you know, Vincent Man was handing out money like crazy to the bodybuilders that competed. Right. Uh, that's the only time Joe gave anyone anything that worked for him, including the bodybuilder. He felt precious. He had to do something. What he did with me is he, he didn't give me a raise or extra money. What he did is he gave me, I, uh, me and my girlfriend had a, a business at the time called Fox Nutrition, a little health food store. He, he gave me a free ad in Muscle and Fitness and Flex magazines that ran for about a year. Mm -hmm. they, used to, they used to send me bills where... It, uh, like the one, the one for muscle and fitness, this is when muscle and fitness was the biggest bodybuilding magazine in the world, you know, the early, right. they'd send me a bill for $30,000. And then it said, uh, at the amount, it said amount due zero, zero. In other words, they're trying to say, he was trying to say, here, I'm giving you a $24,000 a month raise, you know, because yeah. I'm giving you a free ad. And the one for flex was something like 18,000 a month. And this went on for about a year or two, you know, but the guy in the photo, it was a guy holding up some weed or protein cans. That was Gear Paulson. Oh, okay. He was used. He was the a bodybuilder. He probably never knew that he was used. To that, <laughs> you know, but he was the guy, you know. Yeah. In fact, I saw him once at Gold's Gym, and I was going to say something, but I decided not to. I, he might get pissed off or something like that. He might ask me for money. Wait a minute. What do you mean? Right. Do you right. <laughs> I decided not to say. Anything, you know, but he was a big guy. Yeah, it looked like he had good potential, but he never really did anything. No, nothing. I don't know why. That was the highest placing ever had was that third place at the night of the champions. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I don't clearly remember any weak points he had. I couldn't tell you why. Yeah. And, and he was tall too. He had like a yeah. good structure. Yeah. Well, he kind of is like that other guy from uh, the Scandinavian. Remember the, who was the guy with the big forearms we talked about? The oh, Gunnar, Gunnar Raspo. Yeah. He's another guy. Yeah. That, that, that you know, just there's nothing really didn't do anything at right. all. So, and yet, you know, he had these, some tremendous body uh, him and uh, brisbo uh, we mentioned earlier it probably had the best natural forums i've ever seen yeah yeah you, you got to see these guys forums well chuck sipes was up there too but i never saw him in person these yeah two, i saw their forums up close and they were like legs yeah they were gigantic yeah unbelievable. And i asked i always i asked both men the same question i said how did you get those forums i thought they'd say well we did 20 sets of wrist curls and nothing Genetic. <laughs> they didn't do a thing. They didn't right. work. Right. Mike Vincent told me the same thing when I asked him, how'd you get those forums? I don't do any forum work. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am with my skinny forums trying to... Right. Do <laughs> right. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, Thierry Pastel was fourth in that show, so he did good again in another show. And then uh, Ron Love was fifth. Yeah. And then Twilliger was sixth. Duckles was seventh. So Beckles had dropped. And then uh, Mike Ashley was eighth, which is interesting because only a couple of years earlier, Mike Ashley was a close second in the Night of the Champions. So, yeah. wow. Yeah, Mike had really dropped down by the 1990s because it's just the competition was getting too tough, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mike Mike had a great build, you know, very symmetrical, but he wasn't a big guy, you know. No, he was kind of narrow and he didn't weigh that much either. No, he didn't. It was like 180, something like 185, something, but yeah. maybe 90. And, you know, you put him in a lineup with the bigger guys, he's going to be overshadowed. And, yeah. and that, that probably accounts for his low placing with the contest. Yeah. It wasn't that he wasn't in shape, because I'll tell you one thing about Mike Ashley. He was always in shape. He was a fanatic. Oh, yeah. Always. I, I, I remember in Europe, he used to bring his own food in Tupperware. He wouldn't eat in restaurants. He was so pragmatic. And he just weighed everything he ate. This yeah. guy was, and this guy was, would never enter. He would never enter a contest. I <laughs> ago i said to him do you still do that he says yeah 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 you're still that meticulous about you? he says absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i want to mention a couple uh amateur shows that year Derek, because we had uh some really uh, a lot of great amateurs were competing in the early 90s and yeah. you know back then it was hard to get a pro card right because like at the usa championships which i want to talk about right now you had to win the whole thing 
not just your class. You had to win the whole overall in order to get your pro card. So there was a lot of good bodybuilders that didn't turn pro. And uh, Mike Matarazzo was the winner that year. Mike came out of nowhere. He came out of the East Coast in Boston. And he trained at Gold's Gym for uh, the whole summer. And I remember he was really huge and bulked up when he got there. And by the uh, by July, when the USA was held, he won the whole thing. He got really shredded and ripped and put it all on the line. And uh, he was the new big uh, rising star in bodybuilding. Matarazzo is the favorite, I think. Let's hear more about him. I really dream of going like professional or because I was only 16 years old. I just wanted to get bigger and, you know, try to impress some people around with my, you know, my neighborhood, my friends. But after the first year, I made so many gains so fast. I, w- I wanted to pursue it. And... Um, after about a year or so, I decided I wanted to be a professional bodybuilder. My ultimate goal is to get up there on the stage with all the pros that I idolize and to uh, stand toe to toe with them and show them that I can go with the big boys. No stopping me size wise. I can get I can get as big as my mind wants me to get. You know, after the Gold's Classic, I got up to 285 pounds. You know, I had 23 inch arms. You know, measurements. Um, I set no limit. You know, it's just like when I come into the gym, I set no limit. I I don't time myself. I don't count the reps. So um, I'm just gonna keep getting bigger and bigger every year. I'm just gonna keep improving, a barring accidents. You know, by the grace of God and uh, thanks to my parents' genetics, I'm just gonna keep going. been known about Mike, but you learned a little more about him in that, that profile right there. He is from Massachusetts, but he's living now in the hotbed of bodybuilding, Venice, California. Eventually, you wind up in Venice, California, if you're any kind of serious bodybuilder, to find out what it's like. Train side by side with the best in the world, the professionals, Gary Strider and Mike Christian and the likes. And, and you also trade secrets, and you train on some of the best equipment available. I said I think he's a favorite at this point because he did so well in pre-judging, and when you've got that boost going into the pre-posing, you automatically assume the favorite spot. He's definitely one of the favorites and the biggest guy by far in the contest. And tonight we're going to find out the difference between genetics and freakiness. He's definitely a, a genetic uh, gift, gifted bodybuilder, right. but he's got freaky size that some of the other guys are not carrying. Kenny Flex Wheeler, on the other hand, has genetic shape. And we're going to find out what the judges are looking for. Is it the freakiness and the mass and those those arms? Or is it the genetic balance of a Flex Wheeler or a Chris Carmier? The judges, from show to show, will assume a different personality. they fluctuate because you've got eight or nine different opinions. And um, from show to show, it just depends on what, what the collective minds come to an agreement on. But he's definitely got a lot of genetics and a lot of freakiness, which may favor him in the overall standings. Mike Matarazzo, folks, from Massachusetts, currently living in Venice. And we're going to find out how he stands as we have the awards for the heavyweights and, guess what, the pose down. All- I think I was at that contest. I think I was Yeah, it was in L.A., right? Wasn't in L.A.? Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah probably. It. I became good friends with Mike. He was a, he was some, like you said, the Boston area. I was from New York. Yeah. We were like two Eastern guys and we used to talk all the time. He was a very nice guy. I, I remember him telling me that he uh, used to be a, uh, a, a, what they call a bone breaker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he was, he was he a was, bad dude. Yeah. He was an ex boxer, you know. Yeah. He was a tough guy. He, he used to yeah. do like on, uh, on debts and loans, you know, and this that. Yeah. Yeah. He had that face that he could be scary looking when he wanted. Right, I, right. I would, just, I would just picture, I remember saying to him, Mike, I said, I tell you, if you showed up at my door to, to collect a lot of money, I, I'd give you my ATM card and said, take it over. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, I guess uh, it was pretty intense that summer training at Gold's Gym because you had Flex Wheeler who was in second place. Right. And uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, wasn't, uh, yeah, Chris Cormier was in fourth place. Yeah. Right. So Chris and and Flex Wheeler were uh, training partners, yeah. and they would be uh, they'd be yelling at each other, you know, across the gym floor. Matarazzo and, and Flex and, uh, and Chris. Well, you know, it's funny that because I just remembered, 
I, at that show, I remember interviewing Flex also, and he said to me almost the same thing that uh, that that Vince Taylor had told me. I, I said to him, uh, you know, I said, you know, you got a great symmetrical physique with great shape. I said, uh, I said, don't. I think you do very well if you turn pro, because you know he didn't get the pro card because he didn't win. You know, right? He says to me, I don't think I'm good enough to be a pro. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you yeah, got to yeah. laugh <laughs> when you look at how things turned <laughs> out just a couple of years later. Yeah. This guy was a phenom- not good enough to be a pro. I, can, <laughs> I, can, I personally consider him one of the uh, definitely uncrowned Mr. Olympias. Me too. That yeah. Handful of guys I call uncrowned Mr. Olympias. Because yeah. they definitely had all the goods to win. Flex, right. uh, Kevin Levrone, Sean Ray, uh, and there's one or two others that I can't think of at the time. But these guys, to me, could have easily won Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's the El Sabati in 19, uh, I think it was 97. 97, I was, yeah. I was there. I had him winning over Dorian for a number of yeah. reasons. Dorian had a lot of injuries. You know, he had the bicep. Or bicep, yeah. Like bicep, you know, and, and I was I was right next to these guys. I saw them. And I'm telling you, that year, uh, people would, you know, they start, tried to tell me that uh, Dorian, again, won because he had a better back. I mean, uh, uh, Nasser's arms were much bigger than Sean's. I mean, uh, Dorian's. But people say that Dorian won because of his better back. Nonsense, I'm telling you. Uh, yeah. no, Dorian had a slightly bigger back, but it wasn't much. It was kind of, I almost compare that contest to uh, when Heath went against Kai Green. Do you remember mm-hmm. how close it was? I yeah. Mean, their backs yeah. were even. Yeah, you, you can't say one had a better back. They were they were even the going right through the show. Yeah, it, it was almost like that, except that that I'd say Nasser being in absolute peak, the best shape he was ever in. I would have given it to him, but that's another story. But you know, just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I don't think Flex was that big, as big as he got the oh, next no. year, because the next year he won it, but he yeah. still had amazing shape, and he was a heavyweight. Yeah. And he was shredded, and uh, and I remember Sean Ray was doing the um, the play by play for ESPN, and I thought, and Sean Ray was saying that he thought uh, Flex should have won. I think he knew Flex, so they had a friendship at the time. Yeah, that's true. But he was saying because of the, he Flex or uh, Sean Ray thought the more symmetrical, yeah. aesthetic physique should win, where Mike Matarazzo was just kind of like big legs, big arms. He had the short short legs. Remember, short legs, longer torso. So he wasn't as symmetrical, but he just out-muscled everybody. And, and Matt yeah. Rosso was really in shape that year, though, too. He was- Back. A lot of beef up there. Yes, there is. And, and, you, and you like? I, I personally like Kenny Flex Wheeler. I like his symmetry and balance. All right, we'll see about this freakiness you spoke of. They, they go Kyle Norris, five. Chris Cormier, four. Dean Caputo, three. There's Flex Wheeler, number two, and it is Mike Matarazzo winning the heavyweight division. And just like that, we're going to bring all of our division winners up for comparisons and a pose down. So Mike will just stay where he is on the stage, and we're going to bring up Al Escobar, the bantamweight, Billy Sappho, the lightweight, Bo Matlock, the light heavyweight, and our middleweight champion, Charles Durr, is up there as well. So there you see. Now, we're going to have the chance to see the pose or the uh, compulsories here as we see Mike make his way over to the left side. They're going to go in order. And it, take us through it. Walk us through well, it. Again, you see the contrast in the weight classes, and it's relative to the height. You're going from short to kind of tall, and in each height and weight class, they're getting bigger and bigger. And they're being compared uh, on an equal basis from the calves on up to the traps at the top, base of the neck. What you're going to find here is that the judges are looking for uh, aggressiveness. They're looking for body part comparisons as far as relatively to size and detail and definition. And then they're going to be taking into account the overall package. And again, we got the contrast between Bo Matlock and Mike Matarazzo and the freakiness size of Matarazzo because he's huge and the genetic shape of a Bo Matlock. How can that not be an advantage, though, this quote-unquote freakiness size when you've got him checking in at, at what, uh, 231 pounds, and then you've got Al Escobar coming in it's at 140. Yeah, it's an advantage, and I think for the shorter guys, the lightweights and the bantamweights and the middleweights, they have a tendency to get overlooked when it comes down to the overall, because what you find is guys that are taller and heavier have the same attributes as the guys in the bantamweights and the light heavyweights, and a lot of times, most of us are conditioned to, to assume that bigger is better, and that weighs to the advantage of the heavyweight and light heavyweight. Charles Durr is holding his own in the middle there, the middleweight on the back shot for sure he certainly yeah. is and this is a good reason that they have division winners unfortunately only one person here gets a pro card and uh 
it, it has a tendency historically to go to the heavyweight guy or the light heavyweight guy. For the lighter guys, the lightweight, bantamweight, middle, they've got to have a knockout punch. All right, they've asked for the pose down, folks. I, I really like this segment because you get the music blasting and you get these guys kind of showing off a little bit. The ego has to take charge well, just the a bit. thing on the line and on their minds right now is that professional card. This is what it's all about. Let's face it, the pose down is your last opportunity to show the judges what you have. And Al Escobar went for it and stood right beside Mike Matarazzo. You can't, this is not a place to be afraid. I mean, this, you've done the homework. You've gone through the ups and downs of the low carbs and all the training and the aerobics. you got to get aggressive and take what's yours. Do they really chase the guy they think is the favorite? Is that the, so the way that it goes? That can be to your advantage and to your detriment because the guy that's the favorite with the biggest arms or biggest legs can expose yours if yours are not up to par. So sometimes it's better to hold your own ground. All right, here we go. Uh, who do you like? I forgot to ask you that. Matarazzo's freaky size is swaying me towards him. I like Bo Matlock. Okay, let's listen up. Mike Matarazzo. Well, you were torn. Yeah, I mean, it's a coin toss, basically, because they're both equally good. I believe Mike won out on, again, his freaky size, and, uh, you know, it's a coin toss. It's up to the judges. The judges went for muscularity, just He's vascularity. Got He's got it all. He has got it all, and Mike Matarazzo from Massachusetts, now by way of Venice Beach. I gotta deal with this guy in the pro. You oh might God. just have to see him down the road. He's gonna make me eat my word. I think that the reason Mike won that year was he was, he was in peak condition. Yeah. The best he could possibly be for his body. Yeah. Was even, and it's true, Flex had better muscle shape, uh, better overall look, but he wasn't maximized. He did the next year. Yeah. He different. That's the reason Mike won. And Mike did have those phenomenal, gigantic calves also. Yeah. Guy, he, he, I, remember him, I remember Mike Mater also telling me the same thing Chris Dickinson told me years before, that when he was a child, when he wears shorts, the other kids would make fun of him. They called him Popeye because he had these gigantic, even as a kid, he had big calves. Yeah. Uh, totally genetic, you know. So, yeah. But. That, that was an exciting year because it, this guy came out of nowhere out of Boston and he was a new rising star and everybody thought this guy was going to be, you know, that's, that's yeah. exciting when that happens. That happens once in a while. Yeah. Or somebody will come out of nowhere. Yeah, like a dark uh, you know, that Nick Walker we were referring to, he, he kind of yeah. reminds me of that, of, of Matarazzo, how he came out of nowhere too. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, never, I had never heard of the guy when he showed yeah. up by Nick Walker. Yeah. Cormier got fourth place, so he did pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another guy that could have won Mr. Olympia. Chris yeah. Cormier, yeah, I mean, he, he uh, Chris, Chris had all the goods to do him, too. I mean, he had everything. He could have won. Yeah. If, if uh, you know, if any of those guys, Coleman or Lee Haney, if any, uh, I'm not, sorry, not Lee Haney, Dorian, if they had come in a little bit off, you know, Chris could have won. You know, but yeah. Unfortunately, it never happened. You know, but Chris had everything to win. He had all the tools. Let me, let me see who won the North America that year. Because I remember back then in the 90s, the only way you could get a pro card back then was you had to win your class at the Nationals or you had to win the overall at the USA or the North America. Now, the North America at the time, that was America, Mexico, and Canada. I think Paul DeLette might have won that year, the North America. Uh, no, it was, it was Ray McNeil. Oh, Ray Mc... Oh, geez. Paul was second. Oh, Paul was second. Okay. Yeah. Paul must have won the next year, 92. Yeah, he had to win in the next year because I know he won the North yeah. America. Oh, poor, uh, poor McNeil. You know what happened to him, right? Yeah, poor Ray McNeil got shot by his wife. Oh, man. She took thought he was cheating on him and shot him with a shotgun to the face. Oh, oh yeah. God. They, they said that it kind of blew his head off, man. What a, what a way to go. I, I met him a couple of times. You seem like a really nice guy. And I remember... When he competed, in, I think it was an Iron Man show in the early '90s. Mm -hmm. Sally McNeil is that's uh, his wife. His wife, yeah, was there with like three of the kids, and they were just going crazy, rooting for him, jumping up. They were like in the row before me. They were, you know, hey, hey, hey. they were going crazy, rooting for him and stuff like that. I mean, it's amazing how things turned out that you know she wound up killing. The weren't, weren't they a military family, Jerry? Yes, yes, they were. Yeah. They were both in the military. Both in the military, right? Yep. Winning the heavyweight class was this year's NPC California champion, Ray McNeil from Oceanside, California. He began training at 17 to improve his football performance and a few years later won the NPC Armed Forces Championships. 
He's gifted with superb proportions and boosted that by doing his dieting homework for this show. His wife is also a top-level bodybuilder, and should their children decide to train, they may become the biggest kids on the block. Ray has ambitions to become a new kind of pro. I want to set a new trend if possible, you know. I want to be as big as Lee Henry and as ripped as Rennell as my is. <laughs> Once it got down to the fight for the overall, there was no question as to who would claim the right to become a professional. The complete package that was Ray McNeil walked away with the crown. Showing that bodybuilding is a sport for the whole family, his two children climbed on stage to flex next to Dad, the duly crowned North American champion. For American Muscle, I'm John Kobeck. Again, I only met him a couple of times. I remember sitting at an Olympic contest with him and Paul Dillette, you know, and he seemed like a nice guy to me, you know. But, you know, you, know, you never know what goes beyond the scenes. I don't know. Yeah. So I remember seeing uh, the video of the 93 Olympia. He was in that. Yeah. And uh, I remember he had real thick uh, traps. His traps right. were super thick from the back. Right, right. He, he had like really some really good body parts and some missing body parts. So he wasn't really complete. Right, that's but true. But he was good enough to uh, at least get his pro card, you know? Right, that's right. Yeah, it's a shame what happened to him. Yeah. Yeah. Got a big snake, all you gotta do is make a dance, you know what I'm saying? Like me, daddy. Come on, I'm gonna my son. I'm gonna do another neighborhood, like my boys. Up to no good, just as many skirts and the ride is packed. Roll it to a mall called C-Tac. C-Tac. Cruise in, and the cops don't like that. Round them all once and don't come back. Four door rolls with a black exterior. Turbo Bentley, white interior. A Rolls Royce full of big suburbs, that's a wit citizens, walking in the mall, look at how I spit, sloppy dress brothers make the female blitz, big long starters, black low tops, Mac daddy hat got me looking like pops, but that's cool cause I'm macking anyway, and your female's my prey, and I'm calling out scratch like Chuck D, sister we missed you, get with me, and they're running, running, their boyfriend's running, the big boss is so I wonder how Paul Dillette looked in that show. I don't remember. A great deal of controversy surrounded second place finisher Canadian Paul Dillett. Few had heard of this gigantic ex-pro football player from Montreal. Mike Christian and nutrition expert Neil Spruce helped him carve his 300-pound frame into a ripped competition physique, complete with 23-inch arms. More legs will finish this six-foot-two diamond in the rough. When I don't either, to be honest with you. I, I know what he, I, I was there. I think I, I, I don't know whether I saw him win the North America. I don't remember, but I, I remember seeing him around the time, and he was pretty big. <laughs> at the oh day. yeah, yeah. He's already huge. That guy. I mean, another guy. Jeez. He's probably one of the biggest bodybuilders I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if he had a little bit more detail in his back, he would have been unbeatable. I yeah, mean, unbelievable. Unbeatable, for sure. Nobody could be. If he had just, well, he needed two things. He needed a better back. I mean, not, not width. He had the width. Yeah. But he needed more detail, and he needed to learn how to pose. And I tried to help him with that. Because he, when he do the back pose, he kind of, you know, he kind of emphasizes, um, he kind of crunch, you know what I mean? Yeah. So his back looked narrow when he, yeah. uh, he looked like a, you know, he, I told him you have to bring it out, bring out the lats, you know, show the width. Yeah. But because he probably knew he didn't have the detail of the back, so I guess his way of hiding it was to scrunch his back together, thinking that, yeah. you, know, you know what I'm saying? It would give the illusion of having more detail. It seemed like he had no uh, no mind-muscle connection with his back at all. Like he no, couldn't he, flex it. He couldn't flex it right. He just, yeah. you know, the posing really hurt him. Because, like I said, other than the back detail, he had everything. Gigantic calves. I mean, there's a photo of him uh, uh, posing next to Yates at one of the Olympias. He, his calves were uh, just as big or bigger than Yates. And Yates yeah. had a, immense calves. Yeah, and he just dwarfed them everywhere I, else. I remember asking Paul, I said, Paul, uh, your calves are definitely genetic, right? 
He says, no, they, they were not big when I started. I was a skinny guy. Mm. He says, hey, let me show you. And he takes out a picture of himself when he first started. And sure enough, he's skinny. He's wearing shorts. He's skinny as a rail until it comes down to the knees. That's, That's amazing. And then suddenly you have these big bulgy calves. I said, Paul, you <laughs> all that skinny calves. Come on, man. <laughs> you have only calves in this picture. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't it seem like uh, Paul Dillette was one of those guys who really responded to the drugs when he started taking the drugs? He just blew up. Oh my God, he sure did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Paul, Paul's problem, I think I might have mentioned this. His problem was he, he'd ask dozens of people for advice, and, and yeah. some of the advice would conflict and wind up right. hurting. Like that time at the Arnold show where they had to cart him off, where he, he yeah, where he cramped up, off. yeah. Went into rigor mortis while he was posing. You know, that was a diuretic problem. He had to go to the emergency room. Luckily, he survived and all that. But yeah, but uh, this guy also, along with Sergio Leave and uh, you know maybe Ronnie Coleman, easily one of the most genetically gifted bodybuilders ever. Definitely. Definitely. Just, just a freak. I mean, just uh, oh my god. I remember he when he, uh, one of the, he had those looked like almost varicose veins. Of yeah, course. yeah. Yeah, one time he was so cut, he had veins going through his abs. I mean, women would look at him and they they turn away because the veins yeah. were so. I mean, they couldn't handle the look of those veins all over. Right, the right. So it was like too much for them, you know. Uh, he was a funny guy. There was a lot of fun to hang around with, Paul. You know. And he's he's healthy today. Thirty years later, he's healthy. Yeah, he went up to Canada. He started a bodybuilding federation. He slimmed yeah. down. I mean, he's now a you know he's not big anymore. He looks pretty healthy though. He's slim. Yeah, and, uh, from what people tell me, he's doing great. I mean, yeah, uh, I think the organization's doing really well. Yeah, he married some woman up there and had a, a little daughter and stuff like that. And he's very happy. I'm happy for the guy. Yeah, me too. You know, but I'm happy for the. I mean, uh, hopefully he keeps his health. He's not taking any drugs or anything. I don't so, think he is. No, you know, he might actually live to a nice age. You know. Yeah. I, I'm hoping he does. He's. I like Paul. He's a nice guy. John Simmons won the light heavyweight class. You remember John Simmons? No, I don't remember this. Either. Black bodybuilder. He was, I think, he was from Detroit, maybe. John Simmons, a police officer from the tough town of Detroit, appeared on stage with unbeatable shape to capture the light heavyweight class. He started training eight years ago just to see how he would do, and last year he won the light heavy class at the NPC Junior USA. A former star athlete in football and wrestling, Jake, as he's nicknamed, is working on his degree to become a registered nurse. I just vaguely remember him. Just vaguely. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny. I see him at the shows now because he's the coach of the of uh, Andrea Shaw, who oh. is the current Miss Olympia, Miss oh, Olympia right? women's bodybuilding. Yeah. So she's yeah. won it now two years in a row. Yeah. And John is her uh, is her coach. And whenever I see him at the shows, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember John Simmons. He's like, oh, he was like surprised I knew who he was. I'm like, well, I go, yeah. I go way back. And he yeah. goes, where did you compete at? And I go, well, I didn't compete against you guys, but I remember, you know, reading the magazines and, and right. following you guys, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's talk about the other NPC show of the year, which was a really big one. This is one of the most famous NPC nationals ever, Jerry. Oh, man. Are you talking about the national? Yeah. I'm going to tell you right off the bat, right off the bat, that heavyweight division had – the greatest line of bodybuilders You're in, right, right. In, in NPC and bodybuilding history. Re, just read, read off those names. L let people hear the names of the guys over there competing there. Well, Kevin I'm, Lebroni was the winner. Yeah. Uh, Flex Wheeler was second again. He was, got second in the USA, was second here. Paul DeMeo was in third place. Ronnie Coleman, future Mr. Olympia, was in fourth. Uh, Matt Mendenhall was in fifth. Bob Chicarillo was in sixth. Chris Cormier was seventh, Edgar Fletcher was eighth, and Dean Caputo was ninth. Yeah, that was some lineup, boy. Wow. Wow. Future great champions in there. You know, so Lavroni that year had lost to uh, Paul DeMeo at the Junior Nationals. Right. And uh, Lavroni came out of nowhere, out of uh, Baltimore. Okay. No one had heard of this guy at all. He was another, like Matarazzo, just a complete shock, a rising star. And uh, they went down to the wire, and uh, uh, DeMeo beat him by one point, one mm -hmm. vote. It was that close. You so a couple months later, Lavroni turned the tables and came in looking much better. Yeah. Uh, tan, he had a better tan. He was more cut. 
And man, this guy had a pro level physique to win was the that, nationals, you know. Was that show in Pittsburgh? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I remember that show. But I'll tell you a funny story about that. But uh, I met Lavroni, right? Uh, well, I met him at that contest, but not long after that, I uh, we were asked me to interview, and I met him at uh, what was then called the Pacifica Hotel in Venice. Yeah. I went up to his room and he had the TV on, right? I was supposed to interview him on his arm training, I think, or something like that. And unfortunately, what was on the TV was the Junior America contest that he competed in. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> and he was totally focused on the TV. Yeah. He wouldn't turn off the TV when I was interviewing him. So every question I'd answer, he'd go, yeah, no, uh, yeah, no. Oh, God. no Another no, bad interview. <laughs> no detail, nothing, you know. And, yeah. And I, and I walked away, and I, I'm thinking, how do I help? Do I write this guy? I have nothing, you know. But he, I, I did manage to get his exercises before I left, so I had to make a whole article, you know, of, of his routine because he didn't tell me anything. I had right. to talk like I was him. Yeah. You know, I mean, I didn't lie and say it was him, but I had to like say, well, he does bench presses because blah blah blah, you know. But he didn't give me anything. Yeah. And and uh, that that was the time I think I told you the story. Not long after that, I go into Joe Weider's office and Joe was telling me, he says, he says, you know, anybody can write a uh, uh, bodybuilding or anyone can interview a bodybuilder. It's nothing. He goes, he says, oh, oh I remember now the, the conversation was, I asked him why photographers, why he pays photographers so much more than he does writers. Mm. He says, well, you know, I have to understand, John, bodybuilding is a visual sport and uh, <laughs> the, the, the photography is most important. He says, as a matter of fact, the truth is anybody can write a body bullying article. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to him, I said, listen, Joe, I said, you think so, right? You think anybody can write? Let me tell you something. You, you know, you had me interview Kevin LeBron about two weeks ago. If you sent in a guy who won the Pulitzer Prize and, <laughs> and the Nobel Prize in Literature and put it <laughs> Kevin LeBron, the guy would have run out of the room screaming in five minutes because Kevin LeBron was not answering. <laughs> he was saying yes and no, yet and I still managed to get an article. That takes experience, and it takes a certain amount of knowledge of bodybuilding. You know what I mean? Right. Not everybody can write. I think you're underestimating some of your <laughs> I'm not necessarily talking about me. I'm talking about anyone. Right, you know? right, right. But it turns out that after he turned pro, and, and, and since he wasn't watching himself on TV, Lavrone, I did interview him several times after that. And he became quite loquacious. In other words, he, he was talking. He was great. I, I interviewed yeah. him at the Firehouse Restaurant in Venice. I remember one time I interviewed him. I even commented after the interview. I said, Kevin, big difference now from that first time. I said, <laughs> I said, you don't remember? I said, you were watching yourself on TV and you didn't answer me mostly. And he said, oh, man, I'm sorry about that. I guess I was just so <laughs> That's all right. Don't worry about it. I, it worked out okay, you know. But I interviewed him late, uh, later on. He, he, I don't know if you remember, he got a uh, pectoral tear. Yeah, he tore it in 93. Yeah. yeah. And it was, you know, there was a big controversy whether he'd be able to compete. And this Because he was a he was one of the top pros at the time. Yeah. He got so second I, Olympia the year before. Yeah. So I interviewed him about that. I interviewed him about whether he'd be able to compete again and this and that. And he talked about how he found a great surgeon who did a fantastic job. Yeah. So I, so I said to him, well, how did it happen, Kevin? He says, well, I was doing, uh, you know, 450 pound bench press, something like that. Everything was good. Something gave. And, you know, he's good. Then suddenly he goes about five minutes. He says, wait a minute. Hold on. He says, Jerry, don't write that I did uh, that it happened during bench presses. I said, why? He says, if, I, if you write that it happened during bench presses, people will think it was re related to steroid use. Mm. So I said, what do you want me to write? He says, write that it happened with flies, chest flies. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I wrote that, but the, you know, I mean, I, I did as he asked. I, I wrote that it happened when he was lowering the weight from the fly, but it happened to, you know, I don't know what, why he would think. Everybody, everybody tears their chest doing bench presses. It's always yeah. bench presses. No, but I don't know why he would think that people yeah. would associate bench presses with steroids. I don't and know. Flies. It doesn't, you know, I never figured no. that out, but you know, what can I say? He was always strong on bench presses. I mean, I've seen like those uh, Road to the Olympia videos that yeah. Suru Okabe used to do and he was always benching 500 pounds. And this is like a couple of weeks before the contest, you know? Yeah, he's strong in, in uh, shoulder presses too. Yeah, yeah. And I see him doing, he's doing damn seated presses with 300 pounds. Yeah, yeah. Very strong. I mean, I, I saw him preparing for that. Remember that comeback he did? What was that? 52, 53 years of age? Yeah. A couple of years ago when he tried to make a comeback in the Olympia. Yeah. 
I saw a tape of him uh, uh, training back east, you know, for the contest, and he was doing seated presses on a machine. It had to be like 300 pounds. It was like almost a press beyond the neck. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh my God, he's using press beyond the neck with 300 at his age. Yeah. He'd tear his shoulder to bits. Yeah, yeah. And there was another occasion when they, he was doing a seminar, a thing called the Fit Expo they hold out here. Yeah, and, I remember that. And I was walking by the room where he's giving the, uh, you know, the seminar. And I, of course, I had known Kevin. I, I'd interviewed him. Something. So I stood in the back of the room and listened to him. And somebody asked him a question of what he did for shoulders. Because, you know, Kevin had great shoulders, you know. He, so he, I remember him saying, he said, I never, he says, all I do for shoulders is, is lateral raises and, and, rear, and rear lateral raises. So the guy says, no presses. He says, never do presses. <laughs> I, you know, and like, I, I, I'm, looking, I'm thinking, why is he saying that? I, yeah. saw, I saw him do presses. Why yeah. is he saying? I, I never could figure that out. But that's what he said. And I, and I just left the room after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was a, a pretty unique bodybuilder and definitely one of the best pros of the 90s. So that was his, uh, that was his contest where he got his pro card. So that was an amazing yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then Flex, like you said, same thing as the USA. He had a great physique. He just needed to be a little bit bigger. So yeah. Yeah. that's two second places in a row. And then he finally won the next year at the USA, yeah. 92. You know, Kevin underestimates his physique because after he competed in that, when he went, well, after he made that comeback, you know, that comeback attempt. Yeah. I had uh, done a, uh, some sort of video review of the contest. And when I spoke about him, I said he's gotten in, you know, because remember, not long before he had no physique. He kind of gave up. He became real small and stuff like that. I'm not going to say he had no muscle, but it looked nothing like the Kevin uh, uh, Livroni, who was a pro bodybuilder. He had a very small body, uh, comparatively small body. Mm -hmm. and, and he came back to enter the Olympia. And I remarked, I said, you know, to come back where he, where he has most of his upper body muscle back. Yeah. And what was it? Was it 52 or 53? I said, 53, I think. Yeah, I said, that's a remarkable accomplishment, accomplishment. But Kevin has the problem that a lot of older bodybuilders get. His legs, unfortunately, did not come back to the way they were. Right. So it was a noticeable difference between his legs and his upper body. And I think that's why he didn't do well. Yeah, his legs were really bad. Right. So I get a call about two weeks after. And who is it? It's Kevin LeBron. And right away, I start to apologize. I thought he was calling because he was mad about what I said about the legs. <laughs> he didn't know what I was talking about. I said, no, no, never mind, Kevin. No, no. I, I just don't know. What, what he called me for was he said to me, Jerry, he says, what are these guys doing now? I said, what do you mean? He says, these guys in the Olympia, they had these gigantic full mu round muscles that I've never seen before. He said, are they taking, what are they doing? What are they taking to get that look? You know? And I said, well, I'm not really sure. I said, I heard there's a rumor they take what they call side injections, all this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I said, Kevin, I said, I said, you see, he basically was felt that he was like nothing compared to them. Yeah. I said, Kevin, you're underestimating yourself. I said, the physique you had in the 90s stands up to any one of these guys. And I believe would beat most of these guys today. Yeah. I said, I said don't put yourself down. You were a lot better than you think you were. Yeah. So he said, thanks. I said, well, keep in touch. And I never heard from him again. But I mean, I was yeah. surprised that he said that because he thought that compared to like guys like Phil Heath and all those other guys, that he had almost no physique. Yeah. I, 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 I don't believe that's true. You know, I mean, well, he, he had been out of the competing for a long time. So they had yeah. a shot coming back, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it, I guess in his eyes, they looked a lot better. Than, but, you know, yeah. but he has to kind of compare him not to the way he looked at 52 or 53. But the, the way he looked when he, he was, to look, like, yeah, you know, in the in the early nineties, like what we're talking about, yeah. that was a different Kevin LeBron. That when guy, he was in his twenties, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a geez, a tricep. I mean, come on, yeah, man. yeah. Like, when he did this pose here with, with you know, almost like the most muscular, yeah, yeah. You, you, you take a look at you, you look at look look up that photo on Google and compare it to like Philly. He's right up there with Philly. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he's right up there with Philly, just as good in that pose. Yeah, yeah, just as good. Actually, a little better because his pecs were better than these. And then Ronnie Coleman was doing uh, – well, he had competed on the national level for a couple of years. But uh, this one, he ended up getting fourth place. And he supposedly was drug-free because he got on the American team to go over to the world championships where yeah. they did drug testing, and he won. Yeah. 
and that was in Poland. I think he only weighed like 212 pounds. So right, right. big difference from the Ronnie Coleman that would come on later. Yeah, that's where I met. Uh, that's the year I met Ronnie Coleman, and I and uh, and I remember him uh, telling me. I didn't ask him. He volunteered the information. He said he just mentioned that he was drug free. I I, I said uh, I, I said really. I said I, I said you must be very responsive. He says yeah, this and that. He told me the story how he went into this gym in Texas and the guy offered him a membership or something like that. You mm -hmm. know, and he responded amazingly fast. You know, I mean, he looked like a bodybuilder. He'd have been lifting weights for football and stuff like that, but yeah. nobody had a bodybuilder's physique and this and that. But the point is that the thing that stands out of that conversation was, remember, he was still an amateur bodybuilder, like you say, 212 pounds, much smaller than he eventually became. And I said, Ronnie, what about when you turn pro? Aren't you, you know, aren't you going to be pressured into taking drugs to get the size and stuff? And he says, I don't see myself doing that. He says, I I'm on the police force in Texas and, you know, they do drug testing. He says, I can't, I can't take drugs even if I wanted to. <laughs> well, that changed. <laughs> in retrospect, you have to laugh. Yeah, that, yeah. That turned out, you know. But it's really amazing that he was able to take fourth place in the Nationals in that lineup. Yeah. Free, you know, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah he was just a, another genetic freak. I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean, there are some, there are people today who look at photos of him from that contest and say they liked his physique better then than he did than he did when he won the Olympia. Yeah. Because they felt that he was too big at the Olympia. Yeah. Well, he had that. His, remember how tiny his waist was? He had that really yeah. small waist. Very small waist. Yeah. Very small waist. Yeah. Incredible shape, man. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's no way you could go from 212 to two, what, 275, whatever you weigh, and not have a, your waist get bigger. That's a Yeah, right. 290. Yeah. 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 Can't do it. <laughs> Uh, Chris, Chris Aceto, the, you know, the contest prep coach, he told a funny yeah. story because he knew uh, Cormier back then, Chris Cormier. And Cormier had taken uh, what he took fourth at the USA. So Chris thought, Chris Cormier thought the way he's going to get his pro card is he'll go to the Nationals drug free and try to get on the team and then go over to the team and uh, win the win the Mr. Universe. And then he gets pro card and then he could go compete as a pro, you know. Yeah. So uh, Chris Aceto didn't go to the Nationals that year in Pittsburgh, but he thought for sure Cormier's going to get on the team. He said, no, he's going to be better than him. And he, he calls him up after the prejudging, and he goes, I don't think I'm going to make the team. And he goes, you got to be kidding me. Who goes, who's going to beat you? And he goes, there's this guy from Texas. He goes, he's huge. And he goes, he's drug-free? And he goes, yeah, he says he's drug-free. He goes, he, I think he's going to beat me. <laughs> that, was Ronnie sure that was Ronnie Coleman. Ronnie took fourth, and Cormier only got seventh. And never made the team because Ronnie was on the team. Wow. Interesting story. And Matt Mendenhall, that was Matt Mendenhall's last good year. He got fifth place, remember? He, he was a really, he was big, real big and a little bit smooth. But, man, yeah. he, he looked really good. He, he was a real strong fifth place in that contest. Yeah, you know, he, he passed away not long ago. Matt yeah, last year. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is that they always, everyone always says the same thing about Mendenhall. He had all the gifts to be one of the greatest bodybuilders ever. Yeah. But if you look at his contest record, it's kind of mediocre for a guy with his physical. Yeah, game. he never made it. Never made you know, it. Like, I mean, they, they always say the same thing about him. He, he just never peaked. Yeah. At a contest. He never was ripped or shredded. He looked right. great. I mean, Lee Haney, the greatest compliment, Lee Haney called Mendenhall the, the most genetically gifted bodybuilder. Yeah. Seen. You know, that's a great compliment coming from an eight time Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, it, it would have been really interesting to me to see Mendenhall shredded. Imagine yeah. him ripped with that muscle shape that he had. Right. It's another guy had huge calves, big, giant form, everything. I mean, eyes, everything. Yeah, the eyes were great. Wide I mean, shoulders. Yeah, wide shoulders. Imagine him ripped. Man. He, he really would have been unbeatable. Who could, yeah. beat, who could beat that? Nobody. I know. Nobody. It's a shame. You know, I, I don't know what the problem was. I don't know. And this was almost 10 years after he kind of made his national debut because he took second to Lee Haney in 1982. And now think about that. Uh, Lee Haney and, and Mendenhall go up against each other at the Nationals. Haney gets first, Mendenhall gets second. Haney goes on to win the Mr. Olympia eight times. And this was the year that he retired. I guess Haney was at this contest handing out trophies. And this yeah. was after he already retired after winning the Mr. Olympia eight times. And yeah. poor Matt Mendenhall still trying to get his pro card. And he yeah. never made it. It's amazing. Yeah. Again, yeah. 
but genetically, it just goes to show you, even with the great genetics, sometimes you just can't get it together. Yeah. I've seen many guys over the years like that. They had, you know, you look yeah. at these guys, they, oh my God, they just, you, you couldn't match their genetics, but they never went anywhere. They, one thing, either they, the head wasn't there or they just couldn't, didn't, couldn't, couldn't get cut or whatever. There's always reasons for it, you know? Yeah, it's a shame, uh, real shame he passed away at such a young age. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, he's a nice guy. I know him pretty well. And Porter Control won the light heavyweight class, and Porter went on to become a really great uh, pro bodybuilder as well. Yeah, Porter was a, a friend of mine, too. He was a firefighter, in, uh, I believe, was it K Kentucky or Tennessee? K Kentucky, yeah. Yeah, he's a happy guy today. He's married, has a kid. You know, he's pretty happy. Uh, still works out. Yeah. But I remember Porter was going to compete in a night of the champion show in New York. And uh, I think it was after the prejudging, uh, and they called me to his room, and he told me that he, he had to, had to drop out of the contest, and he was like, he would have won. He was in great shape. Hmm. I said, Porter, what's the problem? He told me he had severe constipation, so severe that he couldn't even pose. Damn! Wow. So, so he had. This is a guy who had to drop out of a contest that he probably could have won. Because he was severely constipated. What year was this, Jerry? Early nineties. I can't remember exact year. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I know I I, I I don't I can't remember whether it was either before the prejudging or after, but I know he had to drop out, and that's mm. it, it. Was never you know I never wrote it. Or, you know, it was a personal thing. I never yeah. you know I never really uh, and it was never publicized. You know, but that's the reason why he, he couldn't compete. I mean, I, it must have been pretty bad. You know. Yeah, yeah. That's what we tell the bodybuilders: make sure you get that fiber there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the don't ever cut fiber out, whatever you do. You know. Yeah. You know. Well, let's uh, let's finish off by talking about the Olympia. This was, of course, uh, I think one of the greatest Mr. Olympias ever. It was in Orlando, Florida, at uh, the Disney World Hotel, I think. Yeah. And uh, it was Lee Haney's last victory, his eighth and final Mr. Olympia. This is the first time anyone had beaten Arnold's record. Right. So he won the eighth Mr. Olympia. No one and Arnold, of course, had won seven. Right. And um, if you if you watch that tape, man, I mean, it's just amazing contest because I thought Lee was at his best. That was the best he ever looked. Yeah. And all the guys, all the top guys, were in great shape and they had great posing routines. Yeah. They a lot. Of, I've heard a lot of people say that um, this was kind of the last Mr. Olympia that was like the real era before it went over and changed and then it got too, too much, you know, cause then in the nineties, as we've talked about growth hormone came in and yeah. the bodybuilders just had a whole new look. They didn't yeah. look like these guys anymore. They didn't look, they kind of didn't even look human anymore. Like I was talking about Dorian Yates. Yeah. And when I saw him guest post, it, it was like a different look. They, the guys were just supersized, you know, and they stopped looking like human beings. But at this contest, uh, Lee won, Dorian was in second place and Dorian was much smaller, but this was uh, probably the first time that Dorian was really challenged by somebody who had a similar structure at the similar height, because I remember all those times before when Lee Haney was winning, he was going up against smaller guys like, you know, Lee Labrada or Rich Gaspari or Albert Beckles or Mohammed McAway. He right. just dwarfed them and they, they really didn't have a chance. Right. And this was, and then when he went up against a big guy, like, uh, Mike Christian or Gary Stridham, they just didn't have the symmetry that Lee had. So they, they really never challenged him. So this was the first time a guy had the structure, the size, the, the, the height. And uh, he really, really challenged Dorian. So, I mean, it really challenged Lee. So it was really went down to the wire. Yeah. I would, that, that's very true. Yeah. I, as you said, Lee was a little bit bigger than him. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, Dorian was very hard that year. Yeah. Uh, that's again, that's the year I was told that there'd be, uh, you know, a new Mr. Olympia. There was also a controversy because earlier, not long before the contest, Lee had signed a contract with Twin Lab. Oh, yeah, that's so true. Muscular Development Magazine, you know, and that was Weider's kind of arch enemy. Yeah. You know, his rival. And, you know, the rumor was that they weren't going to let Lee Haney win. Right. Plus, he had signed with Twin Lab. That was the was very strong rumor going. Yeah, on. I heard that too. I remember that. So, so, you know, when that official came up to me in the lobby and said to me, "This was going to be a new Mr. Olympia that night," 
I thought about the rumor. I said, it could very well be. Yeah. He, he would lose the contest because they don't want him to set the record. And, and you know, and because he had kind of like, a, if you want to call it disloyal, mm -hmm. to Wida, they'd, they'd arrange for him to lose. So, you know. That was pretty pretty risky on Lee Haney's part doing that. Yeah, it really was, you know. But yeah. I guess the only thing I could think of, he must have had enough confidence in himself because he probably believed there's no way they could take the title away from me if I come in at my best or even a little bit improved. I think that's what his mindset was. Well, if you think back then too, Jerry, I mean, it wasn't that often that a incumbent Mr. Olympia was getting beat, remember? No, no. I, I always talk about that. I, I, talk, I call it the incumbent factor. Yeah. I, I've written it dozens of times, meaning that the, the guy who went to Mr. Olympia already has, I use an imagine, I give it like 10 points. I said mm -hmm. he already has an edge even before the, the curtain opens. Yeah. Because he's the standard. Yeah. As the previous winner, he's the, the physique that all the others are being measured against. Yeah. So if the, if the guy who's the incumbent Mr. Olympia, if he's either improved or at least, again, du same. duplicated his condition the year before, unless somebody else has improved tremendously, yeah. he was almost by default. That's the way it's always worked. Right. And that's how, uh, and I'm not saying he didn't make any improvement, but that's how Dorian Yates, Dorian Yates did improve. But Lee Haney kind of like, he, he was an example of that. He didn't improve that greatly, but he held his own in all the, the years that he won. And maybe a little bit bigger in that final show. He had a little bit more size in the 91, I think. Well, um, also what happened, remember, was in 1990, they did the drug testing and that's he was right. way down in size. Yeah, so. yeah. And now, still, when he came back in 91, he was way better, way right. better. Even though he was down in size at that 90 show, remember, that's the only show where they weighed the bodybuilders in front of an audience. And they, they had a press conference where they brought all the well, bodybuilders. That was, that was 88, I think. What was that, 88? Yeah. Oh, thought, you're right. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah, you're right. yeah but oh, okay, because I was going to say, we, we Lee was the biggest. He weighed like, yeah, 246 or something. Yeah. Way ahead of, I mean, uh, yeah. what's his name? Gaspari, his rival. Yeah. He, 205 you know, right, right. <laughs> but i mean uh yeah i mean uh, yeah that's true right about uh Haiti. maybe that's uh why he re he was so big maybe because he cleaned out from the drugs and then the next year he responded yeah. more you know i think lee knew you know lee haney was smart enough to know that he, he knows he knew that by signing with twin lab he had a couple of strikes against him where yeah. you know, where if he came in off in any way he'd lose Plus, I think he knew about Dorian, uh, how good Dorian yeah. was, because Dorian had won the Night of the Champions. And... Yes, Lord, Dorian was already known. He, <coughs> he established himself as as uh, the guy to, you know, as a top guy. So, yeah. so Lee went all out. Lee Haney went all out to be the best he could possibly be. Yeah. And that's what happened. He, he, you know, again, he was a little bit bigger than he was, I think, the year before. And, oh, of course, big, definitely bigger than 90, because it was great. Yeah. But, you know, bigger than, let's say, 89, 88. And that was enough to, uh, you know, plus the, the slightly better back. Yeah. And, and in really good condition, too. Excellent condition. He, he was in peak condition. I think uh, I would say I've seen Lee when it was a couple of his Olympias. I would say that the 91 show was the best he ever looked. Yeah, I would, too. I would, too. So, you, know. you know, it was interesting, too. They always ask him, like, uh, you know, why didn't you announce you were going to be retiring? You know, because he never announced that he was retiring on the, at when he won. Right. I remember he went to the microphone and he said, uh, he goes, you know, they're asking me if I'm going to retire. And he goes, he goes, I don't know. He goes, I, I finally learned how to peak. Special praise to the people who made those possible. Mr. Joe Weeder and Ben Weeder. Without their undying dedication to the sport of bodybuilding, their unselfishness, this would not be possible. Now we're more than 134 countries. That took a lot of hard work and dedication. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Joe, because you made all of this possible. And now uh, I can give my baby an education, and you know, and that's wonderful. What, what more can you say? And uh, I know a lot of you are expressing, well, Lee, are you going to retire now? No, you know no. something? I've been competing now for nine years, and I finally learned how to peak. <laughs> so I might be around for a few more years. <laughs> Listen, be strong, love each other, 
God bless you. Maybe I'll be here next year. He kind of left it open, like maybe yeah. he'll come back next year, but he never right. did. Right. I, but you I, know what? You know what kind of makes me think that he was going to retire, that he knew it? What's that? If you see his posing routine, he did the exact same routine that he did in 84 when he won it the first time. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Really you remember that po he posed to Excalibur. Remember the, the movie yeah, Excalibur? Sure, sure. Remember how he did the two posing, the two posing, the two musics. He had the one music and then he had the music from Excalibur. Right. And in the middle of it, after the first music was over with, he he lunged down and he put his arms out. Yes. And he held that pose for like a yeah. couple seconds. Right. I remember that in 84. That was very unusual. Yeah. And then then the music from Excalibur started and he did the exact same routine and the exact same music that he did in 84. So I thought it was a perfect ending. You know, he couldn't, couldn't time it any better. Did he, did he finish with that pose also? Yeah, he did that in the middle. And I mean, then he did, he did the music from Excalibur again. Yeah. That, that might've been a subtle message that this was his. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, what a great way to end it. You know, it's like, it was perfect. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I also believe that uh, I don't. So Lee Haney doesn't strike me as a guy who be afraid of Dorian Yates, but uh, you know he might have said in his mind, "Look, I won it eight times. What's the point of going on and on?" I, I, yeah. I you know, I'm not kind of looking at his, his point of view. Yeah. What, What's the point of going on and on and on? I mean, right. How many times are you going to do it? Yeah. I mean, how many, what's the odds of somebody winning it eight times? I'll probably right. hold it for 20 years. Right. So, right. So it, it was, you know, and you know, no matter what he does, even if, even if he's conservative on drug use, whatever, it's still a huge strain to, yeah. uh, you know, on your body to prepare for a Mr. Olympia contest. It's a tremendous strain on the body. Plus, he had the family and his wife and his kids and all that. And, and, and you know the thing is, well, don't you don't you think too, Jerry? He might have saw that this, the sport's starting to change, the growth hormones yeah. coming in, and the guys are getting freaky. And yeah, that, know, do I want to go that route? And, and I'm, I'm sure that influenced him. I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure it did because I remember because the thing he always had was he had that tiny waist with the big. Yeah. You know, he had the he was like he always said he was like I goes I was 250 pounds or 245 pounds with a 29 inch waist. Right, right, yeah. No one I, had that. Uh, at one of the Olympias that was held in Atlanta uh, uh, a couple of years later, you know, I I, uh, I ran into uh, Lee and, uh, you know, he, he mentioned to me that he was 31 or 32 years old at the time. I can't remember. Yeah. And, and uh, he made a joke. You know, we were talking, he's because you know, he was retired by then. We were talking actually about Vince Taylor. That's, I remember the conversation. Uh, I asked him who he thinks would, would be like his successor as a top guy. And he says, I think Vince Taylor has all the goods to duplicate what I did. I think he can win the Olympia over and over again. Mm-hmm. Right? And, uh, and uh, so then I said, uh, hey, wh- you know, why did you retire, Lee? I asked him this. And, he, and he, he pointed to his head. He was going bald. You know, he was, you know, he's going bald. Now, you know, today he has a shaved head, but you can see he was yeah. going and he says, look at me. I says, I'm 32 years old. I'm already bald. He says, I'm aging like crazy. If I would have, he says, if I would have kept it up, I might have been dead in a year or two. So wow, I, yeah, yeah. I got out while I still could. Yeah. We left, you know? yeah. I remember him saying, he made a joke about it. It was funny. You know, you know not many guys will go out like that on top. Not many. You oh. know, they keep coming back, not just in bodybuilding, but in all sports. Oh, boxing is famous for that. Yeah. I mean, you get a guy, I mean, just to take a name, uh, probably what many consider this man the greatest pound-for-pound pound boxer in history, a guy named Sugar Ray Robinson. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was literally, he was actually a dancer. He was a professional who became a bodybuilder. So I'm not a body, a boxer. When he was in the ring, he literally was dead. He was so yeah. light. Yeah. You, you couldn't put a glove on him. I mean, he, he plus... He had power. He could knock you out with one punch. Yeah. He had an unbeatable combination. And, and he was like literally unbeatable, but he stayed in too long. He started getting hit over and over again. Yeah. He was losing the guys that he would have knocked out in one round. He was still fighting. He was nearly 50 years old, right? Yeah. This was no Albert Beckles. And you can't do that in boxing. Right. So he got hit in the head so much that he got this form of dementia that some boxers get. It's called pugilistica dementia where it causes enough brain damage where it looks exactly like Alzheimer's disease. Right. In the last couple of years, he couldn't even recognize his own wife. They're very sad. Oh, man. So, so you know, the, the, so the, the point being that, you know, you see this in a lot of various sports where the guys, you know, you, they just can't keep away. You know, they got to come back. And, and I just don't, under, I, I don't understand it because not only does it mean, not only is the chances of winning slim, but you also kind of in a lot of people's minds, it sullies your reputation. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you look at a guy like Kevin Levroni, who I don't think anyone would deny was a fantastic bodybuilder. Right. But when he came back and didn't even place at 53 years of age, people I see people online, these little punk trolls who never even saw this guy in person when he was at his best. Ah, he was overrated. He was nothing. Yeah. He can't beat these guys. You know, the, you know, in other words, like it's like all of his his victories in the past didn't mean anything. Didn't mean anything. You know right. what I mean? Uh, or Larry Scott was another one. Uh, first yeah. Mr. Olympia won two Mr. Olympias consecutive, 65, 66. <clears throat> he came back, started entering a pro show. I remember there was a pro show. I, I don't. I remember it was either Vancouver or, or somewhere. Uh, Seventy nine. Yeah. Nineteen seventy nine. Mm-hmm. And, and he it, what did he placed like not not even fourth or fifth or sixth or no worse. It was like real bad. Placed very low. Yeah. This was, 
a two-time Mr. Olympia didn't even. Yeah, who was a legend. Yeah, a legend, a legend. Yeah, even today people talk about him. You know, yeah. Richard Baldwin, my friend, says that Larry Scott has the best arms in bodybuilding history. You know, yeah, I wouldn't have disagree with, but <clears throat> they were saying the same thing about him. Ah, he, you know, look, he was overrated. This guy is nothing. You know, right. And, you know, but in his day, he was great. He was underlying. Yeah, he was fantastic. Yeah. So, that's a problem when you come back past your prime. Yeah, you, you risk that. You know. Well, why? you know, we were talking about Haney pulls into the the same music that he posed to when he won the first Olympia. Yeah. Well, Ronnie Coleman lost to Jay Cutler in two thousand and six, and that would have been his ninth Mister Olympia because he would have broke the record. But he he won eight like like Haney did. Right. He came back the next year in two thousand seven. And he was way down in size from just one year earlier. I mean, right. significantly way down. Because, like, you could, you could look at the last few, like the 2004, 2005, 2006. You could see his physique was starting to get worse, but he was still huge, you know. But in 2007, he, was, he dropped down in size a lot more. I remember I was at the show, and he came out and he posed to the same music, the same routine that he won in 98, the first time he won it. Wow. And it was sad to watch because it yeah. wasn't the same physique. And I'm well, sitting there watching it. And I'm like, oh, man, yeah. it's, just, it's, it's just sad to watch, you know. To me, another he got fourth place. Well, I was also sad to me. You mentioned 84, Sergio Oliva. Yeah. Three-time Mr. Olympia. I mean, I, as you know, I didn't really get along with Sergio Senior yeah. that well. But I, like I said, I always give him credit as being one of the greatest body blows easily one of the most genetically gifted bodybuilders in bodybuilding history, but yeah. it was sad to see this guy, and he looked pretty good, I think you'll agree, at the uh, Yeah, the, in his 40s, yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not that he looked bad, but he got what, eight, was it eighth place he got? Yeah. Next year? I mean, it was very, I, I remember feeling actually sorry, I felt bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I said, this guy was so legendary when he won, the years he was at his peak, Yeah. He back gets eighth place. Yeah. You know, and, and, I'm, and I'm thinking of myself. I, I remember Arnold himself when, when Sergio won the Olympia. I think it was was it '69. I remember I showed Arnold a, a picture of Sergio doing this pose in Iron Man, and uh, Arnold looked at this is when we were both at Vince's gym. And Arnold looks at it. He says, "Nobody could beat this guy." Yeah. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger said this about Sir. He says he's absolutely indomitable. Nobody yeah. could beat this guy. Yeah. And he, you know, and then you know that was those words were in my mind when I saw him get eighth place, and I I just really felt bad for the guy. I know, I know. Again, you know, the the, the idiots, the the small minded people will look at that and say, well, you know, maybe he wasn't so great after all. Look, he only got eighth. yeah. I'll give me a break, man. Yeah, it kind of ruins your reputation when you go out like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a. I, I but, but Lee Haney was one. I mean, I can't even think of anyone else who went out on top like Lee Haney. I mean, what a magical career that yeah. guy had. It's unbelievable. But I have a theory about that multi Mr. Olympia thing. I think that there's a reluctance to have the records broken. You know what I'm saying? In other words, yeah, yeah. Like, like the two guys that hold the record, correct me if I'm wrong, are Lee Haney and Ronnie Coleman. They won eight Mr. Olympia titles. Do right. I have that right? Is that right? Right, right. Now, now uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Phil Heath. Was trying to win his seventh in his last. Was it his seventh, Mr. Olympia? Was he won seven? He was trying to win eight. Hey, that's it. You're right. Yeah. Okay, that, that makes more sense because I was saying it doesn't make sense. Yeah, in other words, he was trying to match the record. Right. He would be the third man to win the, uh, the, you know, the Mr. Olympia eight times. Right. And I remember hearing rumors that they didn't want him to be the, the match the record. That yeah. some, some people up in the bodybuilding hierarchy didn't like Phil Heath. Yeah. For whatever reason, you know, they didn't want him to tie the record. So he had like things going against him, going into that, even though he was, even though he was the incumbent Mr. Olympia who should have had the edge. Yeah. He got reversed where he had to prove himself to win. If there's anything wrong with him, they would have used that as an excuse to give yeah. it to him. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, he was off. Uh, he had the, he was off. He had the stomach. It didn't, his stomach was still sticking out. Uh, God, I'm bad on names. Sean uh, Roden. <laughs> Sean Roden, who, who was a friend of mine. I can't believe I, I'm just so bad on names. Sean Roden comes in, peaked in the best shape of his life. There's the excuse. We're giving it to Sean Roden. Yeah. They didn't want Heath to win. Well, and you know what happened with Ronnie, too? Yeah. Um, like Haney kind of 
said, okay, I'm going to beat Arnold's record and then I'm out. Right. You know, he was done after eight because right. he tied Arnold's record with seven. Then he won eight and he said, I'm not going to get greedy. I'm out. I remember the day they had the press conference for uh, Ronnie with the Mr. Olympia in 2006 when Ronnie was going for his ninth. They said, if you win, are you going to retire? And he goes, no, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> I'll bet the judges looked at each other and go, how many times have we got to give this guy the title? Well, and he, he was a little bit off and Jay was looking really good that year. And Jay had been knocking on the door for like three years in a row. Yeah. So I bet they said, you know what, let's just give it to Jay. Well, you know, when they asked the same question to Phil Heath after he'd won it about four times, yeah. I remember this. They said, Phil, how many times do you want to win the Olympia? He says, 10, 10 in a row. Yeah, he said he wanted to win 10. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Never made it. Yeah. No, never made it. No. I believe that. Let me ask you a question as a, as a, a bodybuilding historian yourself. Do you think, do you foresee anyone in the next couple of years? Well, it'd have to be a couple of years. Do you foresee anyone beating the eight time uh, record? Will there be a bodybuilder? Will they be able to win it, let's say, nine times in a row? Do you see anybody on the right? No, I don't think so. Because like what we were talking about before, the, the amount of drugs you got to do to win it once or twice, you won't, you're not going to last eight times. You'll never last. This is my opinion. I'll tell you, I, my opinion exactly coincides with you. I say no. Nobody will win it nine times for the exact reason. It's a self-defeating situation. Yeah. Meaning that even if they have everything going for them, the genetics, the shape, yeah. uh, the improvement every year, everything is right online. The drug use, the, the use of the drugs will somehow escalate or something's going to give. Yeah. Nobody, nobody's going to make it to that nine time finish line. No. It's just not going to happen. Plus, you got all these other freaks coming in every year. You, yeah, know? So you got always these freaks coming out. Like you say, they come out of nowhere. Matarazzo, yeah. LeBron. Who knows could, who could show up? Maybe right. some guy from Cuba who, who is like right. some, right. third believe his brother. Some guy it's six Little foot eight. Or something, yeah. Weighing six foot eight, weighing three. Right, now, right. Makes everybody be look like a dwarf on stage. You can never tell. Right, right. right. So, so I, I don't see that. I don't see anyone. I mean, I, I, if these guys are lucky, I mean, they'll drop out and, and, and not die. You know what I mean? Yeah. They'll just say, well, I, you know, I got an injury or this and that, you know, and have an excuse. But, but you know, but I, again, nobody's going to make it to nine because of oh. the, way, the way bodybuilding, especially pro bodybuilding, the way it is today with the drug use, nobody's going to make it to nine. It's not no. that, no eight, that eight, uh, that eight win record hold, held by Coleman and Haney will last. I don't as Forever. long bodybuilding exists yeah yeah you know uh, until the sun burns out whatever yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's just the way and now then let me let me also say if things weren't like this with the heavy drug use yeah and, and the increased chance of injuries and all that then i believe somebody might have emerged yeah so great that they can win it 10 12 15 times yeah that would get very tired. I think the audience, everybody would be sick of seeing that. Yeah, yeah. I think people, I think if a guy won it more than, let's say, 10 times, I think people would lose interest after. Oh, yeah. come on. This is ridiculous. Let's get, I don't want to see this stuff. The guy's going to win again. It's not, there's no excitement to it. But yeah, it's not like, it's not like Arnold's era where Arnold would, you know, as we've talked about on the show before, come off the drugs, come yeah. back, peak again. Right. I mean, that was a safe way to do it. He could win it six times in a row back then, yeah, exactly. and it was no big deal. And he was getting better and better every year, except for that last year when uh, he yeah. made that movie. Right. But, uh, but like, uh, he was getting better, like, 72, 73, 74. He's getting better. And then he, he was beating everybody, and there was no competition for him. He could have kept going, you know. He could have kept going. And like you say, he had the two factors going for himself. He got off the drugs. Yeah. He let his body heal. And, and also, he didn't stay on the drugs all year round. Right. But, Two things the guys today aren't doing. Right. They stay on the drugs all the time. What do they call right. it? Or something like that. I can't remember. But yeah, they never get off. They never, they never get, get off. off. So they're not giving their body a, a chance to to recover, to recover. Oh. I think I think if they got off, they would lose probably 50 pounds. Oh, yeah. And it would take them like another six months to gain the 60 pounds, 50 pounds back. Yeah. It, it's, it'd be stupid. They, they have right. to stay on all the time. They have to stay all the time. And, and not only that, the psychological uh, uh, price to pay to see yourself drop that much weight would be too yeah. much. Guys. Yeah. They can't handle it. You know, it's, it's like a, a, a guy on, on heroin. I mean, I'm not taking the heroin. Oh, no. and then he goes, oh, give me the heroin, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. 
yeah. it, it can't take it. it can't they, they would go backwards so much physically they, they yeah. could never do it. They can't take it. So, you know, if you add it up. And, and this is the way I think, Jerry, that everybody does it. Every pro does it like this now. So every pro, every pro. where before, like in Arnold's era, everybody yeah. would get off. Right. You know, they respected the drugs and they would get off the drugs and then they would all get back on before the show. If they did that, if they did that, then a guy could theoretically win it 10 times. And as he said, no. And the thing is, when you add it all up, I hate to use this word. It's like these guys are doomed. Yeah. Something's going to happen to them. And I I said, and I I think I said it to you, I said a couple of videos. The only thing these guys could do is be closely medically monitored have blood tests, have even all the extra tests, calcium score, all these, uh, you know, these out of the, off the road tests to find out exactly how their heart's doing, uh, whether they're heading to cancer or anything that that they can do. And if they don't do that, they're dead meat, they're dead men walking. They will die because some of the things that can kill them, John, you don't, you don't get a lot of advanced warning. No. You know, like. And it's probably years down the road. It's not going to happen right now. I mean, a massive stroke, a massive heart attack. Yeah. It's like a bullet. I mean, boom, one minute you're alive, when next minute you're dead. Yeah. So unless these guys monitor themselves, and, and I do believe, it's not just me, there's others that have been, you know, making videos telling, you know, because of these recent deaths, they're telling bodybuilders to be more aware of their medical condition. Yeah. Hopefully it's getting to the bodybuilders and their coaches where they're starting to pay more attention to this stuff. Yeah. Because if they aren't, we're going to see a lot more deaths. Yeah. Gonna At younger a, and younger ages, too. Yeah. It's going to be a regular thing now, unless they yeah. do something. You know what I mean? It seems like it is a regular thing now. And, and as far as the, the powers that be that run bodybuilding, they couldn't care less. I hate to no. I, I run about it. You know, they, 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 they don't do anything to institute safety measures. There's no drug testing. There's no. Well, the, only, the only thing they could really do is just start awarding the title to other people. But then there's going to be too much. The, the bodybuilding fans are going to be like, what the hell are you doing? How can this smaller guy win? Yeah, You know, he's not an open bodybuilding. You got to be a freak to be an open. I mean, it's just yeah. like, yeah. how do you change it now? You know, it's like yeah. it's gone for this so many years, this many decades. It's been the mass monsters. How yeah. do you change the trend now? It would be too yeah. hard. You can't. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, there's nothing you do. Never go back to the Frank Zane era. <laughs> it's never yeah. going to happen. I mean, I think this is why they say that the uh, other divisions like the uh, classic men's physique and the classic are becoming increasingly far more popular. Mm-hmm. And if you go on Instagram, the guys that are bodybuilders, you don't see that many pros, but you see a lot of these you know, men's physique guys and classic. They put dozens of pictures of themselves and they got like 100,000 people following them or more. More people want to look at like that. Yeah, exactly. They, they, you can see the popularity is there. Yeah. So what does that mean? In, in, in the long run, if this trend continues, the you know the Mister Olympia is going to be really, really fringe type of thing, attracting only muscle freaks. Yeah. I want to see the giant body blow. It, it, it's going to get less and less popular with time. And again, I hope this doesn't happen. But if guys do start to die off, then it's going to really be in trouble. And yeah. That's, that's going to. I mean, it, it, then it's going to attract the. Well, I mean, we just had. A Mr. Olympia winner from only a couple of years ago died at 46 years old. I mean, road, yeah. what, what more do you need, you know? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, if I mean, if that got a lot of publicity. Yeah. I, I see, you know, old sites having nothing to do with bodybuilding. Mr. Olympia dies at 46. Yeah. But if it if it happens with the competitors, not necessarily the Mr. Olympia, if the competitors start to die on a regular basis. Yeah. People are going to look at this thing and, and can say, hey, this is a dangerous thing, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to support this. I mean, these guys are killing themselves. It's, who wants to watch that? And bringing know? it back, and bringing it back to Marvin Etter. You know, we got a guy who did it right, who did it for health, who was just a genetic yeah. freak and was super strong and had a great physique. Lived to ninety years old. You know. Yeah. Well, look at Bill Pearls, ninety-one. Yeah. Old, oldest Mister America. He went it back in fifty-three. Yeah. He, he's still alive. Yeah. You know, Bill took steroids, but he never t- took it. Nothing like these guys. No. Did. No. I mean, uh, and he, he's been a, uh, you know, a uh, octo oval vegetarian for years. Yeah. You know, pretty good with his diet and stuff like that. Yeah. So that accounts for his longevity. Yeah. I mean, you can't, like I said earlier, you can't fool Mother Nature. No, you can't. So, you know, I mean, I wish the best for these guys. I'm not trying to be gloom and doom here. I mean, I hate to No, I don't think any of us are. You know, I don't want anybody to die either, but 
but yeah, I have to be honest. This is what yeah. I, I mean. I write about this stuff all the time. I read the medical journals. I see the case reports of people that have gotten in trouble. It's I I know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? I, I if I didn't read this stuff, maybe I wouldn't think like this. You know, you know what kind of bothers me too, Jerry, is when I listen to some of these other podcasts. I don't want to name any of them, but uh, there's some podcasts out there where they have a lot of pros talking, and uh, they they kind of just dismiss natural bodybuilding. They think it's a joke. Like who would want to be natural? It's such a joke. It's such like th- this is bodybuilding, and bodybuilding you've got to take drugs. You know, period. End of story. If you want to be in bodybuilding, you got to take drugs. It's like it's so un- unnatural to think of a natural bodybuilder. You know, it's just right, like right. it's the weirdest thing ever to these guys. Yeah, and like right. I said, they think like 50 is way old, way old. I mean, I, I, I'm going to turn 59 next month. <laughs> I mean, 50 is not old. You know, it, it's it, it's amazing just their mentality and how they think their attitude. It just amazes me. Well, it's, it's, I mean, for, for many, many years, bodybuilding was completely natural. Yeah. It started out, as I said earlier, bodybuilding is... Reg Park, Marvin Etter, Steve right. Reeves, all right. those guys. Bodybuilding is an inherently, or weight training, bodybuilding, what do you want to call it? It's an inherently very healthy activity. It becomes warped when you start taking a ton of drugs. Yeah. You know what I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, like, like Marvin says, that's not bodybuilding anymore. No. It, some sort of, uh, and, you know, and those guys in those podcasts, I've seen them too. In fact, I blocked a couple of them because once you watch one of them, there's some sort of logarithm where every yeah. time I go on YouTube, they put, you know, they, 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 they yeah. and I blocked them all. I don't want to see these guys. Yeah. I don't want to see them. You know what I mean? I have nothing against the person, but I don't want to hear them talk about the drugs they use and how bo- natural bodybuilders have a, a garbage. And I don't want to hear that because that, that's bullshit. These, yeah. guys, these guys are fooling themselves. They're going to, you know, if they think there's a, uh, I've seen some of the stupidest statements that turn my stomach. I yeah. think I, one guy was saying that you could take any amount of Decadurablin and, and not have any side effect. Where do they get this crap from? <laughs> Where do they get this stuff from? You know, I can't stand to hear it. It actually annoys me. Even yeah. though I, I have nothing to do with the drug. It annoys me just to hear them giving out that extent of misinformation. Yeah. Knowing that some kid somewhere is going to look at this guy talking with his 20 inch arm. Oh, uh, you can't get sick. I'm going to get the Decadurab and I'm going to get those 22 inch. And then the kid gets all screwed up because he listens to that maniac. Yeah. I'd rather have guys listen to a guy like you, you know, mm-hmm. Matt, universe, uh, you know, clean bodybuilding, train the uh, old school weight, heavy weights. You know, you look, I don't care what your genetics are. If you train, and I've written this, if you train properly, you follow good nutrition, you can maximize your physique. Maybe you won't be a super elite pro bodybuilder right but they will have a fantastic and i say this for anybody i don't care what if you do it right you're going to make startling improvement and yeah. this all the way up to over 50 years of age yeah yeah I, i've seen guys over 50 who haven't trained in 30 years i've seen this they've come back they start oh they had to start easy remember they hadn't trained yeah. their, some of these guys were completely out of shape it took them a couple of years they got back where they, they, some of these guys are now competing in Masters shows. And they're yeah. ripped. They yeah. don't take any drugs. You've seen these guys. They're sliced. Right. I mean, they're amazing. Yeah. They came back. That's one of the wonders of proper training. Yeah. It's amazing what you could do if you give it a chance. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this notion that you have to, like these guys say, that you have to take drugs to be a true bodybuilder. I say, go to hell. You're full of crap. That's garbage. Yeah. You know, I would switch it around. I said, if you, if you want to take a lot of drugs and be a bodybuilder, make sure you have a living will. That's what I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> well, remember what John Bailick used to say? There's no free lunch. Remember? No free lunch. No free lunch. Right. It's, you're going to have to pay for it sooner or later. Yeah. I mean, if I say to you, if I, <laughs> I don't want to get into the anti-vax because you'll get a bunch of <laughs> nasty cow. I won't get into right, that. Right. That's a whole other discussion. Right. If I say to you, hey, John, you know what? I think this no this notion of gravity is bull. I don't believe it. I, I think the scientists made it up. I don't think it really exists. I think if we really if birds can fly, why can't we? I'm gonna go to the top of that that 200 story building <laughs> and I'm gonna prove it to you. I'm gonna leap off and you're gonna watch me fly across town. Right. What's gonna happen is you're gonna go straight down and you're gonna be splattered into a thousand. Right. <laughs> what you believe doesn't mean a thing if it yeah. doesn't jive with the facts. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, a, it's I, I, I don't know. 
I don't know how it's going to all end out, Jerry, but uh, I just have a bad feeling, you know. I mean, I, I just hope I'm wrong, but you know, I mean, I don't remember. Okay, some of the guys that are dying, like Marvin, they're older guys, but it's still, you still see, yeah, some nine years old. I mean, that's I, I, yeah, that's I'd love point. to go that far, you know. Well, you know, they see the average lifespan of a man, and now is 72 to 74, so he lived a normal lifespan, you yeah. Know? Well, you know, when a guy or a woman dies in the 20s or 30s, that's not normal. No, no. That is not normal. No. You know, and, and, you know, and it seems to happen a little bit too often for my likes. You know, yeah. I, I yeah. don't remember seeing any of this happen when I competed years ago. No. Mm -mm. I don't remember hearing bodybuilders die off like this. No, no. I never, I never saw any of this. You know, you know, and it's it's really up to the individual. You don't have to do what everybody else does. I mean, no, yeah. it's up to you, man. I mean, if you if you want to do this sport and you're going to take that risk, then yeah. you're taking the risk. But I mean, you don't, just because you're in the sport doesn't mean you have to play it this way. You can play it whatever way you want to play. It's it's your life. That, that's what that's one. Th it brings up a point, John. Here's what I would advise people. Anyone listening to this, if you have a coach, fine. You know, you have a coach in bodybuilding fine but here's what you do use your brain yeah if they're, if they're giving you a, a drug program that doesn't look right to you research it yourself don't yeah. just take what this guy or this girl tells you to take because you because they might have trained somebody who was successful don't yeah. think that the same program is going to work for you it could be deadly if they tell you to take for example a bunch of diuretics and a little voice says wait a minute this doesn't seem right and you go online and you look up the toxic effects of, of that dose of diuretic don't listen to them right. if you don't want to work with any more talent to get lost it's not worth risking your life don't just listen to these people you know what i mean, I mean or even I if you're like a, a bikini competitor you know and they yeah, say well in order to make it in a bikini you got to take this and you got to take that to get the hardness i mean you should just say no i'm not going to do it then i'm out i'm either going to do it natural or i'm out they're telling these bikini girls to take clenbuterol and thyroid to lose body fat I asked one of these girls, I said, do you know what clenbuterol is? She says, uh, isn't it a fat burner? That's yeah. all she knew. She knew nothing else. I said, right. do you know how it works? I said, do you know what the possible side effects? No, but my coach, he, he, he's worked with uh, this, that. She mentioned like five girls in one title. He says, he knows what he's doing. I trust him. Yeah. I said, well, you know, I, I, and I get briefly told her what could happen if she takes too much clenbuterol. Yeah, and I, I could tell it went in one ear and out the other. She could, she figures, who am I? Uh, you know, who have I coached? I'm yeah. some guy in the gym. I'm not going to listen to him. Right. So, I God help her is all I could say. Yeah. You know? I yeah. Mean, I mean, just use common sense. Come on. Yeah. Don't listen to everything these people say. They're not doctors. Most they most have no medical background. Right. Use common sense. If you if they tell you to take something that seems out of line, research it yourself. It could save your life. It will save your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're getting the sport of bodybuilding to improve your look, improve your physique, then improve your physique. But you don't have to take drugs. You, don't and if you, don't, you know, if you want to compete without drugs and compete without drugs, but you don't have to take them. I mean, you should do something that's going to make you look and feel better. I mean, yeah, you just got to do, do it for yourself. Yeah. And the thing that really gets me, and I've written this also many times, is these guys and, uh, and women who have no intention of competing. But they take the same drug programs. So yeah. You know, they'll see some drug uh, regime listed uh, that it's some pro takes. Yeah. And, you know, they want to be muscular. They want to have the abs and they want to look good. So they figure, ah, you know, yeah, I think I'll, I'll use that guy's drug. And yeah. it'll, you know, give me that look I want. But they have no intention of competing. So they put their health in jeopardy for no reason because yeah. they, they think they have to take those drugs to get that look. Yeah, it seems like it's the drugs are just so accepted now. It's like people aren't even fearful of them anymore, you know? And what gets me is they don't even know how they work. Right. They don't know what could happen. Right. They have this idea because all these other guys and girls take it, that it must be okay. No, you can never tell. I've, I've, I've always said, and I've written that the, the worst thing about, for example, steroids is you can't really predict what's going to happen. I mean, it could... Make, maybe help you build some muscle or if you have some sort of genetic quirk that you're not aware of, right. it can push you into a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like this guy, Dallas McCarver, from what I understand, he died of a massive heart attack. He, he, had, he had people in his family that had heart disease. Right, right. He 
he was set up to have uh, uh, cardiovascular problems. Right. The worst thing he could have done is take huge amounts of steroids. Right, right. And right. look what happened. Dead at 27. See? Yeah. Unbelievable. So, I don't know. Well, uh, thanks for going over uh, 1991, Jer. I mean, we got yeah. off on a tangent here, but <laughs> yeah. it was a pretty incredible year for bodybuilding because you had a lot of uh, – it was almost like the, the beginning of a new generation was coming in. You know, you had exactly you had uh, uh, Kevin Lavroni, you had Flex Wheeler right there, right. and then Dor and Lee was leaving. Lee Haney was retiring, and then you had Dorian Yates coming up. So it was like the '90s were starting, and this was the new generation of bodybuilders. And uh, right. right, it was a pretty uh, pretty amazing year. Uh, unfortunately, it also heralded the uh, the you know the, the the big drug use and the dangerous drug use era. Yeah unfortunately still exists today that's what i say it's almost like the 1991 olympia is kind of thought of as the last yeah. the last real mr olympia you know yeah. before it got too crazy you know i, I would agree with that yeah I think me so. too yeah and it, it was a great olympia because the guys still looked fantastic and everybody had great posing routines and then uh seeing dory or uh, lee haney retire it was yeah. he was probably one of our greatest champions ever in the history of the sport no, no question about it absolutely yeah. great guy too yeah, and he's still healthy and happy and uh, still a great representative of the sport, you know. He is, he is for sure. Yeah. He did it right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well. Okay, Jared. Well, I guess till next time, uh, thank you again for joining me. Applied Metabolics is your uh, newsletter. We will have the yeah. link right here on the, uh, yeah, on the description so people can sign up for it. Yeah, applied, metab applied metabolics.com. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I have articles in there, you know, where – even the people on the drugs, I don't advise using drugs, but, you know, I have certain articles that can help them, you know, maybe decrease some of the side effects. It's not going to erase them, but, you know, it might help, like, for example, liver problems when you take orals. I, I, have, I have articles about that. But okay. general, Applied Metabolics is not really a drug newsletter. It's, it's, uh, it's bodybuilding, fitness, and nutrition. And it, it's, it contains stuff that you don't find in other places. Uh, I think anybody interested in those topics will get a lot of benefit from them. I really do believe that. Yeah. I put a lot of work into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we look forward to having you on the show again, Jerry. Everybody loves when you're on here. So I always get a lot of emails and people That's love, when, love uh, yeah. when you're on here. We have a big New York mouth, like somebody called me. Like, <laughs> I had a lawyer once, you know, during a trial. I wanted to say something. He turned, he whispers to me. He says, keep your big New York mouth shut. <laughs> and I saw you on that other podcast too. That was really good. So I'm glad other yeah. people are uh, interviewing you too to get yeah. all your good stories, you know? Yeah, I have a lot of stories. That's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who's, who's coming up, John? Do you have anyone planned for to interview uh, on the Legend Show? No, uh, I was supposed to interview Charles Gaines about uh, his partner, George Butler. So I, okay. I'm trying to get that going. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah. Very interesting. But, you know, it, it really made me think when Marvin Eder died, I was like, God, I didn't even know he was still alive. So yeah, I, I got to reach out and try and find some of these old timers that are still around and, yeah. and do their stories, you know. I'll tell you what, if I could ever get a hold of them, I'll refer <laughs> to us. They would be, they must have some fantastic stories. Yeah, yeah. Even going back to the 50s, if, if you know, those guys are, you know, they're scarce now. Yeah. So these guys are like Marvin Eder's age, you know, they're up there. Yeah. But, you know, they'd be, they'd be a great topics. Uh, like they, Len Sell, isn't Len Sell still around? Len Sell, yeah, he's still alive. And Walter O'Malley is still around? Walter O'Malley is still around. I, I think he had some sort of health problem, but I think he's still around. Yeah. yeah those kind of guys, yeah. Len Sell won, uh, he won the Navi Universe twice. Yeah. He's, he's, a, he's a good guy. I don't know the man personally, but he's definitely, a, you know, one of the classic bodybuilders, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, Did you ever uh, have this series of books, Jerry? Which one is that? Yes, Those I girls? did. I yeah. bought them as soon as they became available. Me too. I bought them too. So yeah, because, yeah, anyone who's into history uh, would buy those. Yeah, uh, I'm so glad I got those things, man. That's unbelievable. Did, did Bill autograph it for you? I don't. I don't think he did. No. Yeah, I bought. I bought probably one of the first set. I, I and he autographed it for me. I don't think he knew it was me because he knows me. You know what I mean? I don't think he. Yeah. Did. But he just gave a general autograph, like thank you or something like that. He wrote. Yeah. Uh, Hope you enjoyed Bill Paul. But I recognize his signature. It really was his signature. But yeah. that, those are great. There's like three vibes. Those are great. Three vibes are great. Yeah. Oh, and anybody who loves history of bodybuilding, 
I mean, he, he covers every, it's great. I mean, he put so much work into that stuff. That's where I was reading about Marvin Etter. Yeah, and the other, the other great, if you're really into the history of that, is Randy uh, Roach's. Uh, uh, yeah, Muscle Smoke and Mirrors. Muscle Smoke and Mirrors, that all of them, all the yeah. volumes. I mean, he did a great one. The most recent one where we, he covered the 80 and uh, 81 Mr. Olympia. Olympia. Yeah. And he wants it of all the controversies. I definitely highly recommend those books. I mean, you'll love it. If you love the history, he tells you stuff. I learned stuff I never knew. And yeah. Those are great. Yeah, he interviewed me for that uh, about the 81. He did, did he? Yeah. 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 He, he interviewed me for the first volume of the uh, of the uh, Muscle Smoke and Mirror, where I talked about how I. Uh, what is it? I, how I used to drink eight, uh, eight quarts of milk. <laughs> when I was a kid to bulk up. Yeah. I was drinking a ton of milk and I put on like 50 pounds or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that was the way they did it back then, right? Yeah, it was in the book. Yeah. He, yeah. He's, he's a good good guy. I mean, I mean, amazing guy. He writes, guy's blind. He's, he's uh, unbelievable. He writes, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I have enough trouble writing uh, with sight. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> this, guy, this guy is writing. I mean, wow. I, yeah. I, I, I said those, this to him. I said, those I, books are so detailed, too. I said, you're an amazing guy. I told him, he's amazing. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. I strongly, anyone again, you really want to know the history of bodybuilding, nutrition stuff, read Randy's books. They're great. I have more. Yeah. Oh. Me too. Me too. All right, Jared. Well, thanks again for joining me on all these shows where we went back uh, 40, 50 years, 40, 30, 40, and 50 years. We yeah. do it every year, and I appreciate uh, all the time you spend going over all these shows. Right. So uh, we will have you again again uh, soon, hopefully. Uh, maybe we'll bring some other guests back, and uh, we'll talk about some other topics. Sounds good, John. And keep up the great work and stay healthy yourself. All right. Thanks, Jared. I will. Get off those drugs for crying out. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. And try not to lift too heavy. I'm just doing myself. <laughs> well, you, you'll know when it's too heavy. Believe me. Yeah. So me I'm older than you. I right. knew I, I, got, I knew when, when it got too heavy. Believe right. me. Body will let you know. Right. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right, Jared. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.